The lobbying scandal continues as Boris Johnson's former senior adviser Dominic Cummings is reported to be behind the damaging leaked text from the Prime Minister to the billionaire Sir James Dyson. It comes after more details emerged of David Cameron's efforts to lobby on behalf of the failed financial company Greensill. Well, we're joined now by the Culture Minister, uh, Caroline Dynage. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, Good morning. So e even more damaging revelations. I mean, this, this seems like such a mess. It seems pretty grubby, doesn't it? David Cameron lobbying not just Westminster, uh, but Whitehall and the Bank of England we're hearing today, uh, their de deputy governor. Dozens of phone calls, emails and messages on behalf of Greensill. I mean, he certainly earned his money, didn't he, for Greensill. Is, is this becoming a bit of a cover-up? Oh, no, I, I'm com completely the opposite, I, I would say. I mean, considering that this is, you know, two, this is two prime ministers ago, uh, this current prime minister has taken this incredibly seriously. He's commissioned a, an independent review to look at that whole issue of supply chain finance and how, how contracts were secured and how business representatives, uh, including, you know, former ministers and prime ministers, engaged with government. Uh, and, and, and that review is give, being given the absolute maximum possible access to all the information needed and, and will engage with all those that were involved I, at the time. Okay. That yeah, so he, I, so he, he was, I mean, it, it was brought to his attention. He was quick to um, go for that, you might argue, and to draw that uh, attention to the situation with David Cameron. Some people say it did take him a while and there were people within the government and within Whitehall that had been involved in this and he perhaps should have known about it. But he did do that. However, it was imposed upon him, wasn't it, uh, the leaking of the texts of his conversations with Sir James Dyson and the fact that he appeared to be offering to fix the tax situation. Well, that's, that's not quite right, is it? So, so James Dyson was texting to ensure that his top scientists and, and professionals could come to the UK and wouldn't be clobbered with double the amount of tax so they could help with this ventilator challenge. And don't forget, this was at the very height of the pandemic. We were seeing these horrific scenes on television of, of um, Italy where pe elderly people were being taken off of ventilators to save those that might have a slightly better chance of survival. You know, lives were literally at risk. And I think the public would expect the Prime Minister did absolutely everything in his power in quite extraordinary times to, to deliver that, that, uh, that ventilator challenge, which, you know, don't forget, increased the number of ventilators we had from 9,000 to 30,000 in just a matter of weeks. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody agrees with that. We, we wanted to get out of a really difficult situation. But uh, talking to Gordon Brown earlier, we want to do things within the rules and it just doesn't look good, does it, when some people have access to the Prime Minister and others don't. Uh, Jackie Smith, speaking earlier, said there are companies who could have made the ventilators in the Midlands, but they didn't have access to the Prime Minister. Well, I think I think the uh, the, the government would, were flexing contacts who could make uh, ventilators and, and indeed uh, uh, vaccines all, all over the all over the country and indeed all over the world throughout the, the course of this pandemic, uh, you know, because of the of the health risks. I don't think any government should take uh, should apologise for acting decisively in matters like this. And, and I, you know, the, the Prime Minister has said himself that he would have shifted heaven and earth to make sure that lives were protected and put people got the support that they needed. Government ministers do have to engage with businesses all the time, but there are very strict rules about how we do that. I know, and I think the question is, is that, that um, well, David Cameron has said, I haven't strictly broken the rules, but we'll see as the invest investigation goes ahead. I suppose what it is, the nub of it is, is that it's exposed um, something that everybody feels uncomfortable with. Mates texting mates, the idea of a tax situation, a legal situation being fixed. It feels very uncomfortable, doesn't it? And then on top of that, we found out the person who at the time was advising Boris Johnson um, is the person that seems to have leaked those texts. It feels grubby and mucky in the middle of a situation where, you know, lives need to be saved. I, 
I wouldn't 100% agree with that, Kate. It, you know, clearly people want answers and they want to know that everything is above board. But I mean, just to reiterate, uh, Dyson wasn't asking for tax breaks. He was just uh, making sure his team wouldn't be charged tax twice when they came to to our assistance. In fact, you know, Dyson spent 20 million pounds of his own money on bringing forward this um, these ventilators. So people will rightly ask questions, and it's absolutely right that we get the answers to those questions, which is why. The Prime Minister has uh, ha has commissioned this independent review to look really carefully at all of this. But as I say, you know, there are really strict rules that ministers have to follow. We all know what they are. Um, and, you know, it, it, we, we, of course, have to deal with business people. We have to deal with charities. We, we deal with uh, unions, but it's really important that any of those sort of conversations are, um, are, are the processes are followed and, and we, we go via our, our civil service teams to take anything forward. So I sort of get all that. I think that's great. I, so I'm just thinking personally, I've done quite a bit of mental health campaigning. I've, I have dealt with the government when we were trying to get more money spent on the child and adolescent mental health services. I met some ministers and I was I actually thought they didn't have any understanding of mental health. But I would love the number of Boris Johnson to try and change things for good in this country. But I can't get that. I don't have that. How, how does this work? Why have some people got the numbers? of these very important people? Do, do they hand out the numbers willy-nilly? What's, what's the situation here? Well, no, of course they don't hand them out willy-nilly. I'm not even sure I've got the Prime Minister's number, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, we are talking about someone who is in one of the, one of the top British business people, uh, uh, you know, in the world. We're talking Sorry, about... Just a, a for a second, that... you're a cabinet minister <laughs> and you don't have Boris Johnson's number, but a commercial operator does have his number and you think that's reasonable because he's a commercial operator? Why, why, why is no, that don't. more reasonable? I don't think it's reasonable. I mean, I'm not saying I don't have his number. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in the process of, uh, in the habit of texting the Prime Minister on a regular basis. I may have. You've either got it or you haven't got it. Limp, but, Do you uh, have sorry? a quick flip through your contacts so we can establish this? Have you got your mobile there? Yeah, I've got it here. Go on, have, have a look. look. <laughs> <laughs> give, give him a call because we can't get him on the programme. I mean, maybe we could do a sort of proxy interview. I, I mean, but you, I mean, we, we can laugh about this, but he there is a genuine point. You are in the all cabinet. sorts, Caroline, and you didn't know about it. I, I mean, know, I could have missed a huge... That's where my promotion went. So, so have you got the number? No, I don't have it. So you're in the cabinet, you haven't got the number. I'm very wealthy, very no, successful, no, very powerful people have got his number. That, I, I get it, we're, we're in a pandemic and we were in, we were in the mire a year ago. I get all that, but it just doesn't sit right. And where does it stop? So they were probably trying to do good to get ventilators. They were also making a lot of profit. But what about if bad people get his number and do bad things? That doesn't sit right. Well, you know, I completely understand what you're saying. Of course I do. But I just refer you back. People do end up getting your telephone number, you know, whether you're a minister or, you know, whatever you do for a job, people end up getting your telephone number sometimes. And I just would refer you back to the fact that there are very, very strict rules that, you know, government ministers... We do have to engage with people all the time. Sometimes they have our telephone numbers, but the absolute key thing here is that we follow the processes. There are set rules and processes. We have to follow them. You know that if, if there's anything that in any way is um, mixed in with your political portfolio, in my case, that would be digital and culture. Yeah. You pass it to your private office. It goes to your civil service okay. team and they take it forward. So, look, Caroline, you, 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 I'm sure you're very nice. I'm sure you always follow the rules. I'm sure there's no doubt in your mind, and I'm sure you believe the best in people. But the, 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 the situation is that more and more is emerging. For instance, I'm looking now at David Cameron's situation. So, he wasn't just texting Rishi, Su Rishi Sunak. He was texting Permanent Secretary at the Treasury. There were Whitehall ministers involved in this. There was time spent investigating whether Greensill was an appropriate use for this potential easing of loans, whether it was the appropriate company to be used. You know, this doesn't seem like it's the right access or the right path for them to follow. There will be questions asked about whether they wasted time doing that because of David Cameron texting. I mean, you, it seems that you feel completely comfortable with this and you're saying it's all fine. But is no, really... I don't feel comfortable. I know, okay. I think that Kate, so that's what, wrong. You're what, pushing what are you words cross about and what are you not? 
Well, I'm, I think what we, what we need to do is find out what happened. We need to get to the bottom of this. You know, what what rules were broken, if any, uh, whether anything needs to be changed as a result of this, whether there's learning to be made. People want answers. Of course they do. And, well, and I you think you cross it about it. Matters. You're a minister and you're trying to get on well, with I... your job <laughs> in a pandemic. You haven't got his number and you're thinking, why are you not saying, for heaven's sake, what is going on? Yeah, I mean, I noticed well, there's a, uh, Caroline, there's a, a seven million pound scheme that aimed at helping independent UK film uh, reach international audience and that's been unveiled today but a lot of people will say that's too little too late if you'd had his number you could have got that to this industry that's really struggling in the summer well, you know, first of all, I think seven million pounds in the in the in the pandemic, where you know money is tight. I think we've done exceptionally well to get that. But actually, I, don't, I would say that the the UK film industry isn't struggling. If you look at, you know, we've got the Oscars on Sunday, uh, we have an absolute raft of, of of British talent that's nominated both for their work in front of the uh, the camera yeah, and and try, behind try, it. Try telling that to the freelancers who make that industry work. I mean, the, the heart of that, in the, the UK film industry and media is freelance. And they didn't get any help in the government schemes. They needed this well, money a long time ago. With the create, I mean, so this money isn't about uh, is it, this. This money is all about helping our incredible uh, UK independent film and screen production companies to be able to sell abroad to access international markets. We've always punched above our weight in in this sector. The creative industries generate so much for our economy and so many jobs. But this is just the the, the latest in a line of support we've given uh, the, uh, the the industry. We had the. Um, the, we had the support for um, Film and TV Restart Scheme, a £500 million uh, investment, which has enabled Film and TV production that we've relied upon so much over the last year to carry on right through the pandemic to, to the extent, actually, that the, the last quarter of last year was the second highest uh, investment and, and activity of, of um, British film and TV making ever. So it just shows you how much government investment's been made. And that's also about supporting those freelancers, getting them back to work. The fact that we've been able to keep making great British uh, productions throughout the pandemic with this, this indemnity scheme really has made such a huge difference to, to people's employment. Some would say in, in spite of, of the government, uh, lack of help throughout the year. But I, I do take your point that there is money and well, it's good to find money at this time. I think a investment is a, huge, yeah. is a huge investment in keeping TV and film alive. And, you know, and that just is on top of the £2 billion culture recovery fund, which has been about supporting all the rest of our culture and our arts and our, and our heritage. But the key thing here, it's been a, the most horrific year. Uh, we've just been about making sure uh, all our creative industries, our culture, our heritage is able to have been able to survive, to see it through this dreadful period. And now what we're investing in is encouraging them to thrive and to, to move forward and to achieve everything that we know that they're capable of. Caroline Dynage, uh, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed.